My name is Gus Augustus, and I am a member of Mayor Stephanie Rawlings Blake's staff. I serve as director of the Mayor's Office of Neighborhoods. Uh, this is our second time here at this location, and uh, I am excited to have you. We are excited to have you join with us this morning as we tackle together uh, an issue that many municipalities nationwide uh, deal with on an annual or biannual basis. Uh, budget issues are real issues. Uh, we happen to have a mayor who wishes to include you as a part of the process as we tackle uh, the challenges uh, of closing a budget gap moving into another fiscal year. Today, many of you uh, already have in your hand um, the 2011 Baltimore Citizen Survey. I was talking to a member of the faculty of Johns Hopkins University School of Public Health, Dr. Phil Leaf, a dear friend. Uh, he is actually going to pull this survey off and have his, some of his students complete it. And I encourage you all who have not been online uh, to see the survey, to certainly go online. Uh, it's an interactive uh, web page where not only are you able to complete the survey, but as some of you already have done, you're also able to complete the budget exercise. Um, today, we are going to break up into groups. We're going to hear a presentation by uh, Mr. Andrew Klein, uh, and he will be uh, go, you know, going over a PowerPoint presentation with us. But again, today is about being included in the process. We wish for this to be a very enlightening exercise. Uh, we wish to inspire, inform, involve, and include. In every aspect of this exercise, there are opportunities to ask questions. There are members of Andrew's staff that are here. If you could all raise your hand. Cool, see, some have two hands up. That's a double shot Starbucks. Uh, no. <laughs> Uh, there are members of my staff, mayor's, the Mayor's Office of Neighborhoods, who are also here to assist. If you could raise your hands, M-O-N, Moon, in the house. Um, and the Mayor will be joining with us shortly. So without further ado, I would like to present to you, or introduce to some, uh, Mr. Andrew Klein, who will take us further into the presentation. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, as Gus said, I'm Andrew Klein. I'm the City Budget Director. Um, this, this uh, session today is designed to be um, very hands-on, interactive, um, but before we get into that uh, phase of it, um, I want to talk to you about the, the city budget and our current fiscal situation. Um, and before I do that, I just I want to thank Gus and his staff. Uh, they've handled all the logistics for this event. This is actually our third uh, budget workshop for uh, fiscal 2013. We had one in November, one in December. Um, also want to thank my staff um, who Gus uh, introduced. They will be uh, uh, here to help you in any way possible um, as you, as you uh, work on the budget exercise. Um, and also want to thank the Department of Recreation and Parks and the staff here at the Volmer Center. Um, this is, a, as you can see, a great facility and we really appreciate their help in, in pulling this together. So let me, let me just jump into the slides. You have um, out on the table, hopefully you all pick this up, um, our 2012 Citizen's Guide to the Budget. It's just a handy reference. Uh, some of the slides I show you um, are from this book. Uh, others are from our, um, our three-year budget projections. But uh, this is something that you, know, you, you may find helpful today and, and then uh, as we as the city continues through through the budget process. So the, the, we're in fiscal 2012. Um, the city budget totals $2.7 billion, uh, but that is not just one big pot of money. Um, it's made up of several funds, each with its own uh, revenue source, um, each with its own set of uh, restrictions. But more than half of that 2.7 billion is uh, in our general fund. And the general fund is made up of uh, most of the local taxes you pay, property tax, income tax, um, hotel tax, energy tax, 
et cetera. And this is the fund with which the mayor and city council have the most discretion uh, to guide the city, um, to provide those day-to-day -day services that citizens rely on. Um, and it's also, as we are in um, very challenging economic times, this is where a lot of the action is in terms of having to, um, to cut back on spending, uh, to generate new revenue, et cetera. And we'll talk about that. I want to focus on the, the general fund. Um, this, is, this is where the money comes from. And you can see that big orange slice. Uh, half of the, half of the uh, city's general fund revenue comes from the property tax. Um, income tax makes up close to 16%. Um, and we also have a significant portion uh, that the, I should use my new toy here. This blue slice, uh, highway user revenues, which are uh, revenues distributed to local governments by the state from the state gas tax and vehicle sales tax. Um, that money is used for uh, such things as uh, repairing potholes, resurfacing streets, um, maintaining street trees, managing stormwater, um, traffic enforcement, etc. You can also see we, we rely on state grants, um, and I mentioned uh, there are a variety of other local taxes that, that uh, make up a portion of our general fund revenue. So how is that money spent? Um, you can see here more than half of the general fund revenue is spent on public safety, which is the, the blue slice, and education. And that red slice is, is primarily the um, what's called a maintenance of effort contribution that the city is required to make to the Baltimore City Public Schools. Uh, you can also see that a significant share of general fund is, is spent on what I would call legacy costs, such as retiree pension and health benefits and debt service related to um, typically you know, capital projects that have been that have been funded through through uh, debt financing, and these a lot of these uh, slices of the pie are represent the mayor's priority outcomes, and we've put on the the wall over here a poster for each of those outcomes. And you, if you have the chance, you can take a look: better schools, safer streets, stronger neighborhoods, a growing economy, innovative government, and a cleaner and healthier city. And under each, there's a set of measurable goals um, that we are trying to achieve as best we can with the resources available to us. So just to, a little bit of history. Um, as you know, these have been extremely challenging um, economic times for the city, the, the state, the nation, and the world. And just over the past three years, we have closed some enormous budget gaps. And by budget gap, what I mean is each year we look at what revenue we expect to bring in um, based on our current tax rates. And we also look at what we anticipate it to cost to maintain the current level of services. And so these are the gaps that we have faced in the last three budget cycles. Um, and 120 million in fiscal 10, 185 million in fiscal 11, and 60 million in this, this last budget cycle for 2012. So what have we done? Um, it's been a series of tough choices. We have, uh, we've made city services more efficient. Um, one plus one trash and recycling is an example um, that has saved us seven million a year in operating costs, but it's also greatly increased the rate of recycling. Um, we have, we've outsourced the mowing of our medians. Um, we've consolidated some of our uh, agencies and offices to reduce overhead expenses. Um, those are just a few of the things that we've done in that area. We've eliminated low value programs. Uh, we have a budget process that looks very carefully at every service the city provides, uh, looks at how it's performing, how it 
um, how well it advances these uh, priority outcomes that I talked about. Um, and and based, on, based on that analysis, we have, uh, we've made decisions to, uh, to actually eliminate programs, which you don't hear of very often with government. We have reformed pension and health benefits. Um, a significant portion of that fiscal 2011 $185 million gap was uh, because of the structure of our fire and police pension system. Uh, the mayor made some, a tough decision to, to take that on. Um, in fact, she was in, in court just the other day um, defending that um, because that is, that is being litigated. We've enhanced and diversified revenues. Um, as part of the fiscal 2011 process, um, the mayor and city council enacted a, a $50 million revenue package. Uh, and that, it was a series of um, tax and fee increases that, that were balanced in the sense that they hit residents, businesses, commuters, um, nonprofits, visitors. Um, but, you know, in a city that already has very high taxes, not an easy thing to do. Uh, but it was done to ensure that we could we wouldn't have to lay off police officers and firefighters, cut back on street cleaning, um, and a number of other services. Uh, we, and we've also had to reduce service levels in many areas. Uh, we've, we have rotating fire company closures. We've reduced library hours, pool, the pool season, um, street lighting, tree maintenance. We've closed PAL centers. Uh, we've reduced 311 call center hours. and, and that's really just the, the, the tip of the iceberg. Uh, a lot of our services have been affected uh, by, the, uh, by the constraints that we've been under. And we've also done some things that we know are unsustainable for the long term. Uh, we've we've uh, frozen pay for employees in fiscal 11, um, fiscal 10, in fiscal 12, we, we did provide uh, pay increases to all but the highest paid employees, uh, but pay has been largely frozen in the last few years. Uh, we have furloughed our employees. Uh, this is the third year of furloughs. We've cut our capital spending. Um, I mentioned that we receive highway user revenue from the state. We've lost 100 million of that revenue over the last three years. So where we used to spend $70 million on um, transportation infrastructure out of our current revenue, uh, that has gone to zero. And thanks to the stimulus, we've managed to keep our heads above water, but that money has been spent. So we, when we look ahead, it's very troubling. Uh, and in some cases, we have used fund balance, typically for capital projects. Um, but again, that's not a sustainable practice. I mean, once you use it, it's gone. Not, renew, not a renewable resource. Um, and that's why the mayor has uh, directed us to develop a 10-year financial plan, and, and that's something we're working on now. So we'll get into some charts now. Um, this is a picture of our general fund revenues dating back to 2001. And you know the effects of the housing bubble are rather pronounced. Um, our property taxes and income taxes really exploded um, during that period of time. Um, since then, this is fiscal 2008, you can see um, this is actually taking us out to um, projections of fiscal 2015. But you can see even out in 2015, we are about where we were in 2008, according to our projections. and. Just between 2008 and 2012, the city's fixed costs, which I'll talk about a little bit in a moment, have grown by 130 million. So that's, that's what's putting a lot of pressure on funding for those day-to-day -day services that, that you rely on. Um, so this green bar, first green bar is fiscal 2012. Um, there was some increase in revenue due to that, uh, the $50 million package I talked about. Um, but you can see uh, we expect revenue to, to dip again in fiscal 13, and I'll talk about why. So in fiscal 13, for the first time, 
since the recession began, we'll, we'll, we'll be seeing a, a drop in property tax revenue. Now you may think, well, haven't you already seen a drop in property tax revenue? We've, we're, the recession ended you know, two years ago. Well, this chart is a history of property assessment increases or, decre or decreases um, in the city. And the city, um, this is, there are three groups of properties in the city. Each one is assessed every three years. So you can see during the housing bubble where we had 45, 58, 75 uh, percent increases. Those increases are phased in over three years in terms of affecting your tax bill. So in 2010, we had a 21 percent increase. That was phased in in 2010, 2011, 2012. So we were still, even in this fiscal year, we're still seeing some of those benefits from the housing bubble. Um, but as you can see, we've, we've, begun to, we've begun to experience negative assessment growth, um, and that is catching up to us. And so in fiscal 13, we no longer have the benefit, as all of our other revenues have been dropping, you know, that property tax has continued to grow, but that's coming to an end. Just looking at, uh, at the housing market for a moment, um, this heavy dark line is probably the key one. It's the median price, sales price of home, of a home in the city. And, you know, we're, we're, we're back to where we were before the housing bubble, um, back to 2003 levels. And at this point, not seeing clear signs that we've hit bottom and we're coming back um, in terms of the housing market. There are still a lot of uh, properties in foreclosure, a lot of inventory out there that's not moving. Um, so even though there are other positive signs in the economy, um, we're still struggling with the housing market. The income tax, uh, again, uh, the, when the economy was stronger, this was growing. Um, it has since dropped and is pretty flat. Uh, slight uptick here in 2011, 2012, because we, we increased the income tax rate to the maximum that the state allows, 3.2%. Uh, um, but you know, this is driven a lot by employment. So these gray bars are the number of jobs held by city residents. And you know, we lost over 15,000 jobs to the recession. And we are seeing some signs of uh, job recovery. We've recovered some of those jobs, but it's, you know, it's slow and it's unsteady. Um, our, this this uh, top line here is the unemployment rate. Um, but that doesn't tell the whole story. Um, there are a lot of people who have given up looking for work that don't get counted there. There are people who are underemployed, um, have part-time jobs when they really uh, need full-time jobs. A lot of people have been furloughed or seen their wages reduced. That doesn't get reflected here, but it certainly does get reflected when we look at income tax revenue. Um, so, yeah, we, our, our unemployment rate doubled. Um, again, just like the jobs have started to come back, the unemployment rate has started to come down, but still very high. Um, uh, well above the national rate, which is here, and the state of Maryland rate, which is the, this uh, dashed line there at the bottom. Uh, I talked about highway user revenues, and this just shows you how dramatically um, those have fallen. And that's, that's a consequence of, uh, first, the direct impact of the economy. People stop buying cars. Um, they consume less gas, um, but also a big part of it is that the state is also in a real fix. Uh, um, and they have shifted a lot of this money from the Transportation Trust Fund to their general fund to patch the holes there. Um, so we just need to recognize we're, we're not in a vacuum here. You know, we're affected by what's happening in the state budget. Um, and more and more um, at the federal level. 
we are seeing cuts to federal grants, like community development block grants, community services block grants, um, and we don't, we don't have the funding to, to make up for the loss of that revenue. So unfortunately, you're probably going to see some services start to suffer um, that are funded by state and federal grants, um, really beyond the control of the city. On the, on the expenditure side, I, I talked a little bit earlier about the, the growth of our fixed costs. Um, this is depicting that growth um, back to 2004. And so when I say fixed costs, I'm talking about costs that are difficult for us to control in the, in the near term. Um, certainly there are some things we can do uh, over the longer term. That's why we're, we, we've actually taken some steps already like pension reform and, and health benefits and, and we're doing a 10 year plan to look even harder at these things. But we've gone, this is just in the general fund, uh, we were spending 500 million on these costs and these are again pension, retiree health, our, our required contribution to the schools, debt service, and other things like uh, workers' compensation and insurance and utilities. Uh, we are now, you know, we're now uh, pushing up over 750 million, so 50% increase in these costs, but you saw earlier that our revenues are flat. I mean, our revenues have not, um, they peaked in 2008, and uh, so we're seeing this fixed cost growth and, and not the revenue to support it. One of the big pieces of fixed costs are pension contributions. And again, this goes back to 2004. We were spending, let me just explain this chart. Um, this green line is the employee retirement system, covers mo uh, most of our civil service employees. Um, the red line is the fire and police pension system that covers our sworn officers. And then the blue is just the sum of those two. So we were spending you know, $50 million in 2004. Um, you can see we're projected to be um, over, over $200 million by 2015. And enormous growth in those costs. And, and a lot of that's driven, you can see, see the spike right here. Our retirement systems lost huge amounts of money in the recession. Um, and those losses get amortized over a number of years um, to catch back up. Well, that's, you know, that's going to take a long time. Even, so even as, even as the stock market improves, um, we're still dealing with, those, with the losses from, uh, from the recession. <coughs> so this is sort of a... The bottom line, um, the gaps we're looking at, the red line is our uh, projected cost of maintaining current services, the blue line is our uh, projected revenue, and for fiscal 2013, which we're planning right now, uh, with your help, we are looking at a $52 million shortfall. And you'll see that on the, the uh, as you get into the exercise, we're asking you to um, give us your advice and thoughts about you know, how, would you, how would you close that gap. Um, and it grows as we go further out. Now, we have to balance the budget every year. Our charter requires it. So we, we need to find a way to close this gap, whether it be uh, spending reductions or revenue increases or gimmicks. Um, not that we use gimmicks, but let's be honest. Um, so, to, to the extent that we do not, to, to, to the extent that we do, <laughs> to the extent that we do not close this in a sustainable way, um, in other words, enact revenue increases or make spending reductions that, that can be sustained over time, um, you can see that the situation just gets worse. And you know, we look at 120 million dollar uh, gap in 2015, and to put this in perspective, you know, I, I hear a lot of people say, oh, 52, well, wasn't it 120 a couple years ago? Things must be getting better. Um, well, that's one way to see it, but when you, when, you look, when you look at that litany of things that we've already cut, 
and taxes we've already raised. We've plucked low-hanging fruit and beyond. Um, so, it, and you'll see the kinds of choices that we're, gonna, we're putting in front of you um, are not easy. Thank you. Okay, last slide. The just want to explain the, the the process for the budget. So the mayor will submit her plan to the board of estimates uh, at the end of March. Um, so you know, these workshops are timely. She has not made final decisions on the budget. Um, the the board of estimates reviews the plan, has hearings, and and then sends its proposal to the city council. Uh, this is the ordinance of estimates. Um, and that happens in early May. The city council holds a series of hearings and it must approve the ordinance by June 25th for the mayor's signature. Um, so very glad to see so many people here on a Saturday morning to talk about budget. Um, let me ask, I, I wanna take uh, questions, but then we will, um, I'm gonna have Laura Larson from my staff explain the budget exercise and we'll, and we'll hand that out. But let me just ask if there are any questions about what I've, what I've just presented. Yes, that's true heart. Can you show the slide number, what is it? This one? This one. Pension? Yes. Okay. What, what have you done to reflect the changes in the contracts that were renegotiated. Is that reflected anywhere in these numbers? I would expect that you see some results. Yeah, well, what happened was the, the fire and police pension system uh, was reformed. There was uh, legislation passed at the, uh, in June of 2010. And you can see the path that it was on. And, and so what was done, the, um, uh, this is, I don't want to get into a whole uh, lecture on this, but the, the variable benefit provision in that plan was replaced with a fixed COLA. Um, the employee contribution is being increased from 6% to 10% over four years. Um, there were changes in the years of service required to qualify for the pension, and also um, a reduction in the, the number of months that are used to calculate your your average final compensation, which, which is a, a driver of your pension benefit. So we were facing in uh, 2011, without that reform, this number would have been $64 million higher. Uh, you can see we have a couple years here where our contribution for that system is flat, but it does start to grow again. I mean, it doesn't change the fact that that uh, system lost a lot of money like every pension system did during the, during the recession. Um, but it certainly has, you know, it, it has saved us, we estimate, uh, up to 800 million over 10 years. And we are, in the 10 year plan, we are, we're taking a look at the, uh, this, the other major pension system um, and its features and, and we, there may be changes to that. Do you think you're engaged in the 10 year plan development process? Uh, <laughs> We haven't, we've done a lot of outreach. We haven't had um, citizen forums, but I will bring that idea back to the mayor. And, and you know, you may wanna, uh, when she's here, you can, you can let her know that you're interested in that. Yes, sir. Um, two questions. Yes. The budget is 2 point what, please? 2.7. And the second question is, um, safe, safer streets. Yes. Is that 32.3 uh, or is that 36? I think it was. Hold on a second. 36.3. Yeah. Thank you so much. Sure. Yes, ma'am, in the black hat. Uh, two taxes I need you to explain to me as a citizen. Okay. Recordation tax and transfer tax. Sure. Uh, so those are taxes on the sale of properties. Um, and recordation tax also applies to refinancing of properties. So the city, we were, during the height of the housing bubble, this was in fiscal 2006, we were bringing in 116 million from those two taxes. Now it's down to 40 million. So actually the, the first sign of trouble we had um, was those tax revenues starting to drop. That's when, this was back in fiscal 08, 
the city implemented a hiring freeze that, that exists in, in a uh, certain form to this day. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, so I just wanted to ask a question about the long-term trends here. Yeah. And if I understand this correctly, I understand the three-year projections that we had. Um, what we're looking at is increasing cuts, right? We're looking at cutting 50 million this year, another like 100 million next year, more after that. And all I've seen in the material, certainly the material that's going to be passed today in terms yeah. of the workshop, is just how do we make these cuts? How do we, how do we eliminate the things that are causing this shortfall? Um, and then I see this graph, and this graph is basically, if I understand you correctly about where the, where the cost, the increased cost of the pension are coming from, it's based on the stock market, it's based on the investment. So on the one hand, we're saying, okay, well, the economy is going to sort of come back, we're doing okay. And we're going to just keep cutting things and cutting things until we get down to zero, or until we can balance the budget. Um, but it seems that there's a really big structural kind of crisis here, right? That this is not we need to trim some corners and you know skip on a couple of things. This looks like actually what we're facing is like years and years and years of austerity, right? As we cut city services, um, at, you know, to the bone, um, both because of the city's decisions, the state decisions, the federal decisions, and. Everything that's emerging in terms of responses to this, this global financial crisis, the emerging consensus is that austerity is suicide, right? That what we're going to look at here is a, 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 a spiral of basically you know, disinvestment, uh, decay. We're not going to have the money to do any of the things that we want to do. The city, the economy is not going to come back in the same way. So I'm kind of wondering, I mean, I think it's great that there's this sort of exercise today where we get to say, okay, well, you know, I would. Uh, this cut is more politically palatable to me right. than this cut, right? I mean, that's certainly more participation than this has had previously. But I'm wondering where the where the big sort of structure, like, this seems to be an emergency, not like, oh, we have to balance the checkbook for this year, right. but like, really an emergency about the future of the city. And I just don't see any of the sort of sweeping sort of ideas you need to actually address that. Right? Like, I don't see, for instance, in this pension system, I don't see anything like a consideration of how do we invest our pension money in a way that actually benefits the city, right? And there's certain places that do this, right? Like California has a pension system that invests in local community development. Um, so I'm just kind of wondering like, where, where that process is and how we get started. Sure, uh, say a couple things. Um, first, we, yeah, we, we do have a structural budget deficit. Um, and the, the exercise isn't, isn't just cuts. I mean, there are, um, there are revenue options. There are also even options for increasing investment in certain services. And we'll be welcoming you to add your ideas um, to the mix. Uh, I mentioned the 10-year plan. Um, you know, Ms. Truhart talked about engaging citizens in that. I think that's a good idea uh, because that's where we, we are looking at um, even bigger ideas um, and, and looking at the long term. Because we know we can't you, you can't just keep cutting services. We have to. The mayor wants to grow the city, um, and so you need to have a combination of. I mean, we 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 can't just increase taxes because they're already too high. Um, we can't keep cutting services because that doesn't make us an attractive place to live. Um, but give, you know, given the economy, it, it's uh, it's a tall order. Certainly, um, but we want to, you know, we want to hear your ideas. We want to look at, um, we're going to look at our whole tax structure. You know, it, it, is the tax burden in the right place? Um, could that be, um, could that be changed to generate more revenue more efficiently for the city? Um, so just so you know, we're, we are definitely thinking about those uh, big issues, but it's also true that we do have to, year to year, we have to balance the budget. And so some of these, um, you know, a lot of the things you'll be looking at are things that we, we have to think about. And, you know, I, I don't think we've completed the task of saying, you know, what is it that we, the city absolutely, you know, has to do or spend, protect or spend more on? And, and, and what are some things that we, you know, the city maybe doesn't need to do or lower priorities? So um, we're looking for some input there. Okay, I'm going to have Laura explain the exercise. We'll take about about a half hour uh, for that, and then we will we'll have discussion. Okay, so you're gonna be receiving two sheets of paper. Um, on the first sheet, it will look like this. You're presented uh, with three categories of options, spending cuts, revenue increases, and spending increases. 
Uh, begin by reviewing all of the options on the sheet here, and then you can go to the second page, which is where you'll do the work selecting the various options that you want to go with to balance the budget. Um, at the bottom, once you do that for each category, the spending cuts, revenue increases, and spending increases, you'll total those numbers at the bottom of the page. If your number is 52 million or higher, you've successfully balanced the budget. If you're under 52 million, that you still have a gap. Once you've gone through the options and tried to balance the budget, we encourage you to share other ideas that you have with us, and you can go ahead and write those on the back of the paper. It's good to hear those fingers working those calculators, pencils working on the paper, uh, working out the additions and subtractions. We have with us now Mayor Stephanie Rawlings-Blake, who will share with us uh, a few words of encouragement, give us more instructions, and continue us on in the process. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It is certainly my pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. I think this is our uh, best attended uh, budget workshop ever, so I want to thank you all for making it so. I'm also glad to see some of the council members uh, use this as an opportunity to get a jump start on the budget. Uh, Councilwoman Middleton, whose uh, beautiful district we are using this morning. Thank you. Uh, just so you know, the Silburn Arboretum and the Volmer Center is available for weddings, for bat mitzvahs, for showers, <laughs> any dinner parties, anything you want. We can, we, can, we can help you out. And it is a, a green building as well, so I hope this is not your uh, first time. And if it is your first time, I hope it's not your last time here. I'm also pleased that Councilman Henry is here. You stand up, let everybody see you, Councilman. See, Councilman Henry and I are both, uh, is, are, are you those jeans today? Yes, we're both casual, so maybe that's, it's okay. It's Saturday, we can do jeans. Now, I don't know if, if Councilman Mosby knows how to dress down, but it is, he is here. One of our newest Councilman, Councilman Nick Mosby, thank you very much. And representing Councilwoman Helen Holton is Gloria Peck. Where is Gloria? Stand up, Gloria. Thank you. Thank you. So it is very encouraging for me to see so many of you uh, out here today, seeing uh, the, so many citizens care about what we can do to grow our city. Um, it, for me, is motivational. So I hope it is for you as well. Uh, I'm, I'm so pleased that all of us are in this together, making, uh, taking a constructive role uh, in the budget process. Uh, I'm sure you've already heard the budget presentation. The projected deficit for this year, this fiscal year, is about $52 million. I'm not the first one telling them that. You've already informed them, okay. Uh, and thank you, Andrew, for uh, all of your work putting this together. I, I haven't done this before, and I, I would like to um, thank Andrew and his team for the second year of putting together what I think is a very positive process, this public process, you know, bringing the, the budget to the people was very important for my administration and we're making it happen. And today, with so many people here, I know it is, it is having an impact. So I would like to thank Andrew Klein and his team. Can I give you You know, the, this uh, type of budget workshop is uh, an excellent way to clarify the, the budget uh, process. Councilman Mosby, you should be, count yourself lucky. I don't know about Councilman Henry or uh, Councilwoman Middleton, but I wish we'd had one of these process when I first started on the council. I think, uh, you know, it, it, it makes the process a lot uh, easier to, to grasp, and it really, you know, pulls the, you know, I guess pulls a layer back and lets you uh, really see what's going on. And, and so I'm pleased that to be able to offer, not just for the, the members of the community, but for the council as well, who I depend on to work in partnership. Um, so I'm, I'm glad that you are here taking advantage of the expertise. Um, you know, we are taking advantage, you're taking advantage of our, the expertise of uh, our financial, our budget team, and we're taking advantage of your expertise. Yeah, I say that I, I strive to align my administration's priorities with the priorities of uh, my constituents, and this is one of the ways that we make sure that happens. So I'm constantly impressed. I get updates uh, from the budget workshops with the 
you know, to see if there if there's anyone that's able to budget um, to to balance how long it took, um, things like that, and if there are any uh, other constructive ideas. So I can I'm, can uh, I am always impressed with the responses that I get, the, the thoughtful questions and comments, and I thank you. Uh, I'm very, very grateful that you are doing your part to help us develop a responsible budget and to help us uh, grow our city again. Uh, thank you. I hope your questions have uh, been answered, and I look forward to seeing all of your balanced budgets shortly. Thank you very much. Okay. So by, by show of hands, how many people were able to close the $52 million budget gap? All right, a few. Uh, anyone willing to explain how they got there? <laughs> you want to talk about it? Well, the mic. Well, oh, wait for the microphone here. How do you turn it on? Okay, nobody's going to love me when I walk. Well, clearly in the area of um, city employees and retirees, um, unfortunately there are areas that have to be um, looked at with respect to the increase in deductibles. I mean, we have to look at, you know, to, to, to an extent, I know that this may sound some, some, somewhat selfish, but as long as they, they continue to have a job, I understand that increases are necessary to some extent. So, as long as they're still employed and you're not talking about laying people off, then that to me, they gotta go a little, okay, they gotta go a little deeper into, into their pocket. But, at the same time, I am not looking at in the area of parks and recreation, for example. Um, that gets, that's one of the agencies that gets hard, hit the hardest and has the least money in any city. And um, reducing park maintenance and, and closing the pools is, is not it. And, and in reducing funding for after school programs, you're talking about if you reduce after school programs, you're going to increase crime. So that's an area that you know you cannot, you, I don't think you should touch. When it comes to public safety, last year when I went through this exercise, we had, I was a big advocate for increasing um, police hiring. It happened. Now we need to take a break, you know, to a great extent. So that I put totally that police hiring should not happen this coming year. Um, and it means, you know, and, and given that the city has deep, has improved on its uh, in the area of public safety, I mean, that's an indicator for me to show that. And there's better police enforcement. I do see in the Northwest uh, better police enforcement. Um, with respect to uh, 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 for example, the mounted police, I love the way they look, I love the way they look for and all that stuff, but, you know, they need to be eliminated. Um, with respect to um, art and leisure, closing the libraries, big mistake. Um, you know, I know some people are going to argue, you know, argue that, you know, well, if the library is underutilized, let's, um, let's close it, but you know what, again, we need venues for our for our people to go to. If we're going to cut services in other areas, then we, we need venues for our people. Um, however, I do understand that, you know, with respect to the museums and, and, and orchestras, it's a nice tourist attraction, great, it's good for, you know, culture and so forth. However, they have to defer a little more to funding and grants. And, and not, not uh, so I, I didn't put total elimination of that, but I put, uh, you know, $1.50. Um, 1.50 would be eliminated there. With respect to um, savings and city services, uh, 311, this may have to go, you know. Um, turn off cable, TV, may just have to go. Um, reduce the dirty custodial services at city facilities. I run a nonprofit, we pick up our own garbage, you know. We dump it, so it's, it's employees may just have to do the same thing. Um, this continues support for small businesses. I did, um, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of uh, tossed on that, but I'm putting that back in the budget because I have some savings, so I'm putting that back in the budget. <laughs> it's not going to be a savings. 
cut agency administrative budgets. Cut a little bit, <laughs> but not too much. Um, I mean, because now the, the employees are all burned as it is in the city. And it's unfortunate that certain city agencies have, you know, just a few employees to do the enormous amount of work that has to be undertaken. So um, I didn't put, you know, eliminating all that much. But reduce election fun um, funding. Well, we got to go more to volunteers, and we got to go more to um, maybe the unions can, can participate more in that and so forth. So I came out, you know, with a higher savings, but I'm putting a few more dollars in uh, to certain areas because my, my colleague <laughs> next door said, you know, how can you do that? Right. I said, oh, okay, let me put a couple more dollars. Did, did, you, did you have any revenue Yeah, with respect to uh, revenues, no on the uh, increase in property tax. Um, introduce a billboard tax? Yes, you should. Yes. It, 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 <laughs> definitely, yes. both that. And you know what? If you're going to have liquor, if there's going to be billboards with liquor on there, it should be charged triple. <laughs> okay? Yes, yes. But it should have it anyway. Um, grocery, grocery bag tax? Everybody's, you know, 50, 50, I put some money on that. Advertising sales? Yes, increase that. Um, fee for the circulator? Well, there goes the free ride. You guys know. <laughs> Uh, stormwater fee, not totally, but you know, a little touch of a dollar, put a dollar there. Um, increase energy tax, put a couple of dollars there, unfortunately. And suspend tax credit applications, not totally, but phase it in a way that, you know, this is this, due, this I put a dollar fifty there, anyway. Spending increases, um, the, I understand more now, a little bit more about the stop rotating fire company closures. I didn't put 100%, but um, I said keep 50% 50, 50 of them um, uh, rotating. I know it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a hard issue, but we have to uh, level funding for after school, put it all in there. Do not, do not, please, do not touch after school programs. Um, fully fund prosecutors, well, you know, Bernstein seems to be doing a great job, so um, we know he's all right. Increase lane mileage surface. Well, you know, just don't don't drive down those roads. <laughs> uh, we should restore some money to tree planting and maintenance. Um, we do need to increase funding for economic development. That's the only way the city is going to continue to uh, to thrive. Um, extend uh, pool uh, season. Um, no, well, you know. I put no, actually, but as long as we keep the season that we have now. Reduce property tax by two cents. Um, I didn't put anything there, actually. I just didn't keep it flat. And that's pretty much what I, what I did. I hope nobody <laughs> keeps me up for it. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate that. And, and we have other perspectives, people who got there in other ways. Uh, right here, the white cap. Ella. Hi, my name is Ella Scovins. I'm 72 years old. And I, my big question is, how in the world, you, by the way, you did a good job. How <laughs> in the world did you expect for me, a senior, to go down this exercise to even attempt to get something done with it? Because this is very serious. So I don't know how, what you all do down City Hall, but if this is going to be a yearly thing and is taken very seriously, I think you might have to get some of our seniors a little more time to really read it and to judge and see how it would affect us. Because right now, I, mean, I had to go over it twice and look at it again and did it again. And I said, are they serious? A half an hour? <laughs> kudos to Julius again. <laughs> Well, it is, it is online, so if you, need, you know, if you need more time, you can find it there um, from the home page. Uh, I'm in the back in the black. I love you, Alan. Love you too, baby. <laughs> Hello, everybody. My name is Iris Kirsch. I'm a Baltimore City Public School teacher. And um, I did some things. I, I wrote in some numbers that were not on the paper. Okay. I'm going to focus on those. Um, but if anybody's interested in specific other things that I put, um, I'd be happy to talk about them. The first is under public safety. 
Um, 11A would be to ground the police helicopter except in extreme emergencies. Just like we don't have the fire trucks roaming around the city looking for a fire, that helicopter costs thousands of dollars an hour to keep in the sky. I think we maybe even have two of them that are up there just burning huge amounts of fuel. Have it grounded, have somebody on staff at all times ready to get in if there's a murder and they need to look for the murderer or something of that nature of severity. Other than that, it just needs to be on the ground. The other one is more complex. And number 29 would be a moratorium on foreclosures. Um, Chicago has done this, um, and it saves us money in so many ways. First of all, a uh, foreclosed property does not uh, draw any property taxes. People are no longer paying the property tax on that building. Also, it drops the property values of the surrounding houses. Therefore, those people are paying less property taxes in years and years and years to come. Um, also, they are, you know, havens for crime and all kinds of things. So you gotta have police, more police in the neighborhood to check through the vacant houses. Fires start in vacant houses at a much higher rate than in inhabited houses. Um, also, then we have more of the city homeless, partaking in homeless services. Um, and we have a growing number of homeless children in this country and in this state who are underperforming in schools, who are just at a complete loss, and therefore we want better schools, we need to have children with homes. So I think that that would probably save us a lot of millions of dollars over the course of the long life of the city. Thank you. Uh, gentleman over here. Also on uh, added the line item, uh, and it's uh, simply to uh, repair the compression rate, property tax compression ratio. Uh, our legislatively designed to be about 0.89, meaning the uh, homeowner, because the homeowner cap pays less than the commercial uh, non-homeowner, uh, by, the, by the rate of about 0.89%. Uh, uh, the National Taxpayers Conference most recent study found that we are at the bottom of the top 50 cities in the country are with our homeowner with our compression ratio of 1.03. How does this happen? It happens because of the systemic underassessment of commercial properties to the rate of about $75 million lost revenue in the city per year. Uh, how is that allowed to continue to go on? I don't think we have a, a full-time auditor in that office our major source of, uh, of revenue to make sure they're getting these numbers right and holding them accountable. It's a state function. Uh, so we don't do that. So I did add a million back in for that, for uh, putting an auditor's uh, independent audit agency to monitor those numbers and repair the compression ratio. Politically, it's very difficult to understand, even though KPMG recent study says that our commercial taxes overall are some of the most favorable in the country. It's the commercial owners that go pound on the mayor's desk the homeowner simply packed to you all. We've got to fix that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
that just happened to know about. So if you don't know about it, you just plug it right off. This person I did. What is this? I don't know what it right. is. Plug it right off. Yep. So I'm just saying, maybe you do a better job. I don't know if you extend it or explain things more. Or maybe right. I don't even do too, too many statistics. But some of you say, if you don't know about them, it's easy to plug them off because right. you don't know. But the person's in the trenches, they know you need something like the mountain force. Right. Like, like Jimmy said, they're nice to look at, but I plucked it right off also. Right. But um, other than that, I really did have to do a twice over. I did the ones that I really didn't know first, and I didn't know, and I went back to her, and I know it was hard, but I plucked off a lot of other things too. Right. The only thing that I can really say is don't touch the school systems, don't touch the school programs, don't touch any other programs that are not here. Thank you. Yeah, when we when we were putting this together, we we realized. I said, "What's the biggest piece of paper we have in the copier?" Um, you know, so we we fit as much as we could. And I realized that every one of these, there's a pro and a con, and all kinds of information. Uh, so to some extent, it's about you know your values and and uh, and looking at it that way. Um, and you know, we just had the the senior said. How can you expect a senior to even get through this? And so, but I, your point is well taken on that. Thank you. Um, yes, ma'am. Uh, yes. In the black cap. Yeah. Uh, we've already kind of talked a little, so you know that I disagree with you on some things. Yeah. And like the lady said, she put out a good point there. Some items on here that I'm like, what is it? Uh, the election. We don't have elections every year, so why would there be a billion dollars for it? So there may be something that I'm not aware of. But one thing I'm going to point out to you, I am absolutely against outsourcing. What if the city started hiring people, and as they're redoing their contracts, the new city employees contribute to their pension? Would that not offset it? Because I think the one thing that's missing in the paper is people. You got to get people back to work. You know, and. If you're going to bring them back in under new circumstances, fine. But I think if you leave them out of the formula and all you're looking to do is collect and collect and collect, they have no jobs. You're not going to collect. Your your penny bag uh, things and your soda taxes and all those are on paper. But when you tell me that if I buy X, uh, a soda from the city and I'm going to have to pay more while I'm working in the county, so I'm buying it in and bring it home. So your, your tax is not going to be realized because people are going to find a way Thank you. Thank you. Uh, right there. Yes. Um, hi, my name is Jane Shipley. I'd like to make three points. First of all, I'd like to second the idea of the helicopters, and then I'd like to just say that every time I hear one, I'm reminded of, that a crime is occurring. And it's not the kind of thing I'd like to remember. It's kind of like, no, we're going to die. We don't want to think about it. We know it, but we don't think about it. And it's very stressful. And I, if they're not necessary in the air, I, I agree that they shouldn't be in the air. The second thing I want to talk about is tax breaks to big developers to try to control it. I have always been bothered by this because I've always believed, I love Baltimore, help me. And, and I've always been and I've always believed that if we make Baltimore the city it can be, developers will flock here without being enticed. And instead we 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 discount it by saying to them, oh we have to give you money, here let us give you money to bring you well, she they're bringing jobs. Well great, they're bringing jobs, but where are these employees living? The city of Baltimore has a lot of employees, a lot of employees in this room. Mm -hmm. How many of the city of Baltimore employees in this room do not live in the city of Baltimore? All right. right? And what does that do to us that reduces the income tax that we get because we are one of the few cities that is not part of the surrounding county. The third thing I want to talk about is public libraries in the city, which is one of our greatest resources and an agency that is continually cut and always on the bottom line. You have a $5 million figure here that's attached basically to closing five branches, and then you have slash with your salaries. I'm, I, it does not cost a million dollars to run a branch. The bulk of the library budget goes to North Central. If the branches are spending half a million dollars each every year, I'd be shocked. The last time branches were closed was in 2001, and five branches were closed, including branches in Holland's Place and in Pimlico. When that happened, then Mayor O'Malley was into the city stats. So he sent out a little map. That was the summer after that happened. Kids were killing kids in Baltimore City. And his little map showed clusters of where the kids were killing kids. And they were clustered in those neighborhoods. What kind of message?
message did we send to the children in those neighborhoods when we closed their libraries? We told them they didn't deserve a library. So I'm, 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 I'm upset that library is, as my friend here said, this list is curated. You curated it. I understand you didn't have much room. You didn't have room to put others, which would be nice because we've all been adding others. But, you know, I'm really upset that library is even on this table. Thank you. Not, not to be not to be provocative, but did anyone uh, select cutting libraries as one of their options for getting to? Okay. Okay. Where should we go next? Uh, this table. Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Kim Jensen. Um, I speak as a resident of Baltimore, homeowner in Baltimore, Baltimore City Public Schools parent, and. Um, I'm also here as a member of a group called Be Heard, Baltimore Higher Education Alliance for Real Democracy. And we're a group that is looking to increase social justice in Baltimore. Um, I did balance the budget. <laughs> uh, rather than go through an itemized way that I balanced the budget, I wanted to come back to a word that you used, Mr. Klein, which is a word called values. Um, I think our budget in the city we could sit here all day, go back and forth, this, really, and that, really. But I think at the end of the day, the philosophical question is, what are the values of the city? And um, I would like to live in a city that values its people, that values its children, that values education, values the arts, culture, the people, and all the rich resources that the city has to offer. So therefore, when we're balancing the budget, we need to keep that in mind. I think we really need to keep in mind what this woman brought up and others brought up, which is looking at this um, issue of uh, the pilot programs, the TIP programs, um, the, tech, uh, the, the subsidies that are given to giant corporations who come and relocate here. Um, as this woman eloquently point, pointed out, oftentimes they really don't bring the jobs that they promise. <coughs> oftentimes the jobs are outsourced elsewhere. Um, and yet they're getting millions and millions and millions and millions and millions. Not like the library, which would be one million, but they're getting 13 million, maybe more a year in, um, in tax breaks. So I just want to put it out there. I could, I could probably ramble on and on for us at the city to really please think about the 99%, not the 1%. Because we are the people who pay the taxes and live in our homes and it's our children's future. And so when Exelon wants to build a high rise and we have some developer who is a convicted criminal who's getting maybe $64 million over the next 25 years to build this high rise in, um, near Fells Point, we wonder why they're getting all this money when we're footing the bills for, for, for the city and the, and the services. So. Um, most of you are probably familiar with ex the excellent deal I just went through. I personally think it's a little bit embarrassing when we have this kind of a budget crunch to be giving that away that kind of tax subsidy to a massive corporation. Um, also, Exelon, we were doing our research last night, is not bringing jobs to Baltimore. They're cutting 600 jobs in Baltimore. So putting that out there for everyone to question and think about what are our priorities, what are our values as we move forward in the future. Thank you. Uh, gentlemen. We have time for just two more. Two more? Okay. Um, hi, I want to thank you for holding this to allow the citizens to understand what's happening in our city and to at least voice a little part. My name is Sarah King. I'm a resident of Baltimore and I've lived all around the country and I'm proud to be living here now. Thank you for coming. Um, one, of, one of my beliefs is that if you build it, they will come. If we make this a place that people want to live, that people will come, people will move back from the county, they'll have a better commute to their jobs, and um, they'll be happy about it. So I want to encourage things like the Charm City Circulator, for, for example, is, is a small thing, but so many people I know use it because it's free, and as a result, they visit the, the businesses downtown. That makes it a place that people want to be in, a place that people want to stay. Also, um, I want to encourage perhaps looking into spending a little to save a lot more. For example, if we have stronger organizational resources, one of the discussion topics at our 
our um, table was that they couldn't, um, their community associations, although everybody was very eager to participate, perhaps participate in the community cleanups, they weren't, they didn't have the email, somebody wasn't interested, or there wasn't the proper communication. And this is one way that we get everybody involved to help our city become the city that it really could be. Another area is that I, I strongly believe in is, is keeping our children safe and occupied. And so I, I echo the, the sentiment that was spoken many times earlier today, which is safe our parks and recreation. And, <laughs> and um, this is a rich resource, I think, and a possible source of revenue even. We'll, we'll keep our, our children coming back into the city and, you know, Something, something silly. Provide them with snack bars that they don't want to be at, um, and the pro pro provide them with communication that tells people what the activities are, what they can come to, how they can join, lowering the barriers for for them to participate. And I think this could be a great thing. Thank you again so much for for taking care of the citizens of Baltimore. Thank you. There is? Okay. Gus is telling me there's an event scheduled after us. I have one brief comment about the libraries. Um, the libraries correlate with the schools, and our schools in the city are some of the oldest facilities, and they serve our poorest children. And just statistically, you might want to know that the Pennsylvania Avenue Branch Library services 38 schools. If we closed even one library, we, we can't afford to close one library. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, this is a great turnout, and we would like to collect uh, those uh, the budget exercise forms because we're compiling all this information uh, to bring into the budget process. And uh, I hope that you stay engaged throughout the course of the process. There are many other opportunities to, to voice your opinions. Thank you.